Okay, it is Friday the 15th of October. Hope you're doing well and hope you've had a great week so far. And just going to jump straight in and start talking about Bitcoin. Seen a decent move in the overnight session, which has seen Bitcoin futures bust through $60,000. And it all comes on the back of this headline, which came out in the overnight Asia Pack session, where the SEC is poised to allow the first US Bitcoin futures traded fund to begin trading. And this is, of course, a watershed moment. Uh, for the cryptocurrency industry. I must stress, though, that this has not been confirmed. In fact, the SEC spokesperson declined to comment on this report, according to Bloomberg, who tried to reach out to them overnight. Um, But again, looking at what's been on the agenda here, the push to have a Bitcoin-related ETF has been something which has been underway for several years. So this being, uh, as I said, a watershed moment, and if so, would mean that there's, as you can see on this table, four futures-backed Bitcoin ETFs that could begin trading on US exchanges as soon as this month, as you can see here, 18th, um, 19th, tw- and the 25th of October, from in the likes of Invesco, ProShares being the first one here. And so looking at the chart, the overnight move was was sharp in terms of reaction. We We broke through the weekly high, uh, which was the prior overnight APAC session high at 59K. And as you can see here, we've run up. I've just put a rectangle on the overnight uh, movement that we've seen in Bitcoin futures. Just looking here at this this trend channel with some of the price action that we've been looking at over the last two weeks. So I'm just quite interested to see here. We've just fatigued a little bit on that initial blip on the reaction when Europe is coming to the markets, just found a bit of a top on that top end of that trend line, which would come in, come inside as well, just short of the 61,000 mark. So yeah, some really strong moves in Bitcoin on the daily chart, obviously breaking above 60, if we can close above that is somewhat symbolic. And we can see here that previous high was at the same level on the 10th of May and was an inflection point through the kind of end of Q1, commencement of Q2 of this year and would open up then further upside technical levels of relevance, not until we to get a little bit higher, probably around, first of all, 61, just above 61,350, and then ultimately 64K, and then back up to the 65 territory. So, um, yeah, we'll be interested to see how the close on Bitcoin looks today. But otherwise, other than that, let's just jump straight into an overall flavor of what we've got for other asset classes this morning. And as you can see, equity index futures are slightly positive, albeit a slight drift off their Asia Pacific session highs. It does come in the context of a really strong close on Wall Street. And as a matter of fact, you know, just having a look at the likes of the S&P, the NASDAQ, now over the course of the last 48 hours or so, really phenomenal um, comeback after just printing that double bottom that we had through Tuesday, Wednesday, the mid part of the week. We've just come racing back to the upside. And on the daily chart for the S&P here, we're back above the 50 DMA, which is obviously quite key. And again, I'm interested to see how we close the session later on today. And for the NASDAQ, we're just below that point. So still keeping a half an eye there. NASDAQ obviously tends to swing out and underperform depending on the largely the rate environment and hinged on the uh, the Fed expectations. And on the daily chart, you can see here an interesting one to watch if we continue to pressure on, the, on or push to the upside as we go into the US session today, that 50 DMA with that rectangle here I've put, which has been a key area of resistance previously back in summer. Uh, and if we can break back above there, then perhaps we can continue to push back on on this recovery higher up. But that would be a key obstacle to tackle in the short term for the NASDAQ, which on the 30 minute bar, you can see has just had a really phenomenal ride uh, of late over the last two sessions or so. Um, why has that been happening? Well, a couple of things to just have a quick look at. Um, this is looking at earnings season. Uh, and obviously yesterday, um, we're starting to see that pick up a little bit more pace. A couple more banks were reporting. Um, so the largest financial institutions, City, Bank of America, Morgan Stanley, they all finished higher yesterday post earnings. Uh, United Health Group led gains in the Dow. They were up in excess of 4%. The healthcare giant raised its outlook. Uh, and as you can see here, uh, these green rectangles indicative of the earnings seasons that we've had since the onset of the uh, pandemic and every single earnings season generally we've moved higher question marks a little bit more this time and earnings going forward 
because now we're starting to see just the economy just come off the boil a little bit from that rampant pricing in of the recovery coming out of the pandemic. But certainly be interested to see how things play out. Still super early, of course, in the in the earnings cycle um, so far. The other thing, of course, we had yesterday was the likes of the applications for U.S. state unemployment benefits. They fell to their lowest, as you can see here, since March of 2020. So the best that we've had since the pandemic, showing employers are hanging on to their workers uh, in this tight labor market. And then the other thing was prices. And as you can see here, cost pressures are cooling. Prices paid to American producers rose in September, the slowest pace of the year amid cooling costs for services, including airfares as the Delta um, variant impact impacted demand. So yeah, kind of to explain the rationale why equities have been so bullish, I guess, in a sense, is the case of, look, it's not that the Fed are not going to taper and start their tightening cycle. That's still very much going ahead. It's the fact that Inflation, yes, is high, it's sticky, it's perhaps non-transitory. However, it's cooling. Uh, also, some signs of that being the case. And whether or not it's cooling or not, it's just not going higher at this point. Uh, and that seemingly has been enough from the CPI, PPI reports to just alleviate some of that um, yield movement that we were seeing um, last week, which was really dictating proceedings as people were really aggressively pricing in those inflation expectations. So they've been perhaps reined back a little bit as to where we're at uh, at this moment in time. Uh, some of that, um, the jobless data also helping with some of the positive earnings as a consequence, hence the reason we get a little bit of a bullish sentiment just materialize over the course of the last um, 48 hours. A um, few other things then to be aware of, but before I get into them, don't forget we've got the latest episode of The Market Maker um, coming out on the podcast channel. So again, Apple, Spotify, Google Podcasts, just type in Amplify Me, Market Maker, and the latest episode is going to be going out at 10 a.m. this morning. So remember to check that out. Um, otherwise, yeah, a few other news stories, and then we'll look at a few other charts. Um, this is to do with vaccines. Um, so I don't think this is particularly a big deal, I'd say largely expected, but again, another um, kind of positive in regards to another variable to throw in the mix. A panel of expert advisors to the US FDA unanimously voted yesterday to recommend booster shots of Moderna's COVID-19 vaccine for Americans aged 65 and older or those at high risk of severe illness or occupational exposure to the virus. So again, when Generally, the efficacy rates of vaccines are decreasing. It's you know, well known that then that's going to require booster shots. So the more approvals that come, you know, the more that I can counteract any vaccine hesitancy and things like that to give people more confidence to go, go out, go ahead and get those booster shots. And again, that helps just, again, alleviate any concerns about any returns of COVID as we go into the seasonal kind of cooler months of the year in the Western, in the Western world. Um, otherwise, other charts then, following some of the, the movement in equities, um, oil is right back up there again. Not that there's been anything too specific in an oil-related headline, but as far as the session is concerned today from an intraday perspective, I'd keep an eye on the weekly high that was printed on Monday. Uh, we've come just short of that as Europe has stepped into the market. That would be at 82.18. Obviously, on the weekly um, up, well above that key area of uh, really $80. And so oil looking good at the moment. I mean, from a, from a more multi-day week perspective, even if we were to pull back, you still got some pretty solid support now. I'd be eyeing up at around that $80 handle. And now we're trading at 82. Um, wouldn't be a surprise at all, um, barring anything unexpected that we continue to just, if we can break out above that weekly high, then we continue pushing on with the next kind of technical area of resistance not seen till 84 uh, in the futures market at the moment. Um, currency wise, it's pretty quiet. Uh, dollar uh, perhaps a touch softer this morning. The Dixie's trading down about one tenth of one percent. So just giving a bit of light reprieve for the major currency pairs in top left euro dollar cable up 16, 29 pips each respectively. As far as the commodity market, gold pretty much locked in a, a period of consolidation after the breakout to the upside that we had yesterday afternoon uh, in the US session. Um, so confined it by at the moment, 1800 bucks on the upside in the futures market and uh, be looking down at around the um, S1 and the low that was seen in the APAC session at 1788 as an area of support to define that um, period of consolidation that we're in. All right, a few other headlines. Overnight in Asia, 
Uh, perhaps a few things just to be aware of, uh, just in the context of what's been going on with Evergrande, not too much movement on that specific company in itself, but China um, have come out and loosened restrictions on home loans at some of its largest banks, according to people familiar with the matter. Uh, default risks mounting for China developers as funding dries. Uh, and so a bit of an attempt here uh, to just just get back into control of that situation and stop any spillover effects that that can have from Chinese authorities. Um, in a similar type of fashion here, the PBOC, the central bank, injected 500 billion yuan through its medium-term lending facility. Um, that was very much generally uh, in fitting with expectations. Um, generally, that was what was rolling off and maturing today. So they've just kind of filled that void uh, as well to keep the system functioning, uh, flush of liquidity for the time being. Um, elsewhere, Brexit. Um, I did write quite a bit about this in my notes that you can access on my Twitter account. My handle is here if you want to have a read of that. But a long story short, uh, the European Commissioner yesterday struck a bit of a conciliatory tone, um, presented his pr proposals resolving what's been the, the issue from the beginning of Brexit, which has been the how they're going to deal with trade and the issue of Northern Ireland. And apparently the European Commissioner early in the day told European diplomats behind closed doors that the bloc would retaliate forcefully if the UK seeks to pull out of the Northern Ireland Protocol. Now, the problem that that has is that the PM, Boris Johnson, is expected to um, push back against the latest proposal from Europe. And so, hence the reason why we're getting a little bit of a um, elevation, if you like, in in the confrontation, at least a verbal vet rhetoric happening between the two sides once again. Um, you know, we haven't been here for a while, but we have been here, of course, many times over the recent years. Um, again, what's the outcome? Hard to say at this point. Um, Frost, who's on the UK side, said that the UK is prepared to trigger Article 16, a clause in the protocol that allows for unilateral safeguard measures if serious economic, societal or environmental difficulties result from its implementation. Um, so, again, while the UK have, have kind of um, been somewhat surprised almost by the proposal and, and somewhat concessions being made by Europe so far to come forward um, with their latest plan, um, British demands um, that the European Court of Justice oversight be ended is, is a key sticking point for the UK. So at the moment, um, there's going to be a lot more hot words said, I guess. Uh, but I don't necessarily think that that's going to phase the sterling currency for now because I think the the market's fairly acclimatized to the fact that there's probably not going to be a result of this. It will just drag out for a considerable period of time. If there's any looming deadlines on any type of agreements, they'll just get rolled over as they have done multiple times in the past. Um, all right. So a quick look at the day ahead. What have we got on the schedule? So pretty quiet overall for this morning. Not too much going on. French CPI data coming out um, in a, in a next half an hour or so from when I'm recording this. Expected year on year 2.1%, which will be unchanged from previous. Um, otherwise, it's really more of a US-centric session. As you can see here, you've got US retail sales, first of all. The headline figure for this afternoon expected at minus 0.2% coming back down from the previous plus 0.7, as you can see here that we had previously in the month of August. Now, according to analysts at ING, they say that retail sales will be drag dragged lower by a plunge specifically in vo uh, vehicle sales. Uh, that's more of a function, though, of a lack of supply than a drop-off in demand, given the dearth of infantry to sell, the ongoing production bottlenecks, and the fact that second-half car prices are just uh, astronomically high at the moment. They're up around 45% this year. So outside of autos, the figures should remain positive with rising incomes and surging household wealth providing strong underpinnings. So I guess the takeaway from what they're suggesting is, uh, although it might look weak on the surface, if it is indeed um, a factor of then specifically weighted to auto sales, you can almost disregard that look at the other underlying figures, and it might be that they're actually more positive, but it's just that motor, motor vehicles are pulling the number down. So if there is any initial knee-jerk negative type reaction, just be careful of a quick reversal as, as traders will be looking out for those details. Um, otherwise, on the calendar, you've also got the uh, New York 
Fed manufacturing figure at the same time as retail sales. Then later on, you get University of Michigan sentiment. That's the preliminary number for October, so worth keeping an eye on with that. Looking for a slight improvement from last month up to 73.1 from 72.8. Um, Speaker-wise, Fed's Bullard, non-voter, 445, obviously more on a hawkish disposition. And then Fed's Williams, close one to watch. Uh, voting member speaking at 520. And that is it. So again, check out the latest podcast episode. It's coming out um, later on this morning, 10 o'clock London time. Had a chat with Eddie about the bank earnings from this week and investment banking fees just going through the roof. Why is that happening? How long can it last? Um, How hedge funds are looking to get in on some of that um, deal-making action as well. So um, yeah, hopefully you'll enjoy it. And with that, I wish you a great session and a fantastic weekend ahead. Take care.